Hello, folks, or would you rather say ladies and gentlemen? If you've looked ahead to week two, which starts tomorrow, in fact, uh, the reading includes Saladin, which is the author's name, Atlas A and Atlas B, <clears throat> sections 8.1 and 8.2, sections 10.1 and 10.2. This is a little bit unusual because usually the readings are just from one chapter. But I, again, I'm going to go through these rather quickly and tell you just the major things that I think you need to know. Before we get started, I want to show you a, a gift one of my sons gave to me. I'm going to have to stand up so you can read my sweatshirt. It says, never underestimate an old man who graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy. I thought that was kind of nice of them, or him, whichever one it was. I can't remember. Okay, now we're going to start into Atlas A. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't look at you all the time because the camera is up at the top of my screen. And the book is down here, and I have to I have to look back and forth at the textbook. Again, I apologize if any cats walk across uh, the screen. That's what happened on my last video. A cat got underneath the desk, and I, um, I had a uh, key or a uh, a di ah, can't even think of what I'm trying to say here. I had a keyboard that was not uh, plugged in, but yet it was a a wireless keyboard. They got messing with it and then things went havoc, went to havoc. Okay. Look, Atlas A is on page 27 of your text and it is called General Orientation to the Human Body. We need to be able to describe things about the human body more than just saying this is the heart, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, such things as that. First, we want, we want to start, start by looking at the entire body. Uh, on page 28, you will see what is called the anatomical position. This is the position from which uh, everything else is oriented. And you can see that this young lady is standing upright with her arms extended out from the body just a little bit and her palms facing forward. That is the anatomical position. So superior means it's at the top, inferior to the right, lateral means to the outside, medial means to the middle, so on and so on. All right, now look at that young lady again in figure A.1, and you will see three different planes that are uh, imaginary, imaginary cut through her body. A sagittal, sagittal plane passes vertically through the body or an organ and basically divides it into right or left portions. Um, the sagittal plane uh, is also sometimes called the median or the mid-sagittal plane. A frontal plane is oriented, um, it's vertical, perpendicular to the sagittal plane, and divides the body into the anterior, which is in front, and the posterior part, which is in the back. Uh, there's also a transverse plane that is perpendicular to both of the others and can be cut through the body at any place along the longitudinal axis. In table A.1, um, page 29, you will see a list of about 15 or so of the directional terms. Um, I can't, there are none of them that are more or less important, but just read through them 
uh, try to get a general idea of what they mean. Now, in section A.2, we talk about major body regions. These are regions that we can identify from the external landmarks um, or the external anatomy and different landmarks on the body. It's important, as it says in your text, in performing uh, both a physical exam and in many other clinical procedures. The two, for our purposes here, the body is divided into two major regions. Um, look at page 30 and 31. The two regions are the axial region, which includes the head, neck, trunk, and trunk, or the appendicular region, which includes what some folks call the upper extremities and the lower extremities. I had a hard time remembering that one in medical school, and I learned them as the arms and the legs. That seemed to be a little bit easier. But just remember those two primary regions. This is kind of interesting on figure A.4 that divides the anterior part of the abdomen into different regions. Uh, and this is very important in clinical medicine when you are uh, trying to explain where someone is having pain uh, or so where you hear uh, bowel sounds, etc. Okay, now section A.3, we look at body cavities and membranes. Um, a body wall. Uh, include or encloses multiple body cavities. Each of these cavities is lined by two sections of membrane, and they contain they contain internal organs. Uh, this membrane is called the viscera. First, look at the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. Uh, these are uh, the cranial cavity contains the brain. The vertebral column or the vertebral canal includes the spinal cord. And these two are continuous with each other and are lined by three different level layers of tissue called the meninges. In A.2, you will see different regions or different cavities and some of the viscera uh, and membrane linings. The thoracic cavity is basically in the chest. It contains two lungs and contains the heart. Very, very important parts of our anatomy. Uh, the abdominal pelvic cavity. This contains, or this, as you can tell from the name, actually includes two different but continuous cavities. The abdominal cavity includes all of the abdominal organs, the stomach, liver, spleen, uh, small intestine, large intestine, and pancreas, gallbladder. Um, this cavity is lined by, again, two layers of tissue called the peritoneum. The parietal peritoneum lines uh, the inside of the cavity and is continuous with the uh, vertebral body and or the vertebral canal and the uh, anterior abdominal wall. The visceral peritoneum uh, are surround each of the different organs. Look carefully at these pictures. Um, I will tell you that in the unit exams, there are usually one or two questions that require you to be able to identify a picture such as these. So you want to get a general idea of what the inside of the body looks like. Section A.4 includes or is called the organ systems. We have 11 different organ systems, 
plus the immune system. Uh, the immune system is really by itself and located everywhere throughout the body. So we cannot put it in any other uh, major category, such as in the uh, listing there to, to, on the right-hand uh, column on page 35. There are systems for protection, support, and movement. I've got a cat coming here. If I keep her away. Uh, systems of internal communication and integration. Systems of fluid transport. Systems of intake and output and systems of reproduction. Other authors use different terms, but these include all of the organ systems. The immune system, it kind of stands by itself, and we will cover that in much more detail later. Look at figure A.9 on pages 36 and 37. And these are uh, sketches showing the different organ systems. Okay, that's all for Atlas A. Again, I would uh, I'd like you to make a, get a copy made of the study guide, and perhaps even do the questions on the testing your recall. These would be good questions to show up on the exams. Another note to you, I do not write the exams. McGraw-Hill, our book publisher, furnishes us with a huge uh, list or a huge group of test questions. This is called our test bank. And all we have to do is tell it what to do, how many true-false, how many multiple choice, how many identify and so on, and it will automatically uh, form a, an exam for you. And by the way, each of you does a different examination drawn strictly uh, by happenstance from this test bank. Okay, now let's look at chapter eight that starts basically on page 229. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. We're not doing that yet. Hold on. I want to go to Atlas B first. Makes more sense. I did A. Let's do B. That starts on page 375. And this is much shorter and much easier. This atlas is called Regional and Surface Anatomy. Uh, B.1 on the first page shows the, uh, because this book takes a systems approach to anatomy, uh, it's good to be able to identify different regions where we would find these different organs and organ systems. B.2 tells you more about the importance of surface anatomy. And B.3 is a good learning strategy in a lot of words that tells you something about uh, how to study these photos in Atlas B. This, uh, these courses, Biology 250 and 251, are basically prerequisite courses in a pre-professional program. They, would be, they are required in order for you to attend nursing school, uh, physical therapy, to become a dentist, to become a physician, um, nurse practitioner, but you also then have many, many other courses that deal with the same items when you get on more into the specialty training. But the, this two course sequence functions as an absolutely necessary four hour block uh, that, is that is needed in order to apply for any of these pre-professional tracks. In figure B.1, page 377, you will see different uh, pieces of surface anatomy of the head and neck. Many of these you already know. 
some of these you may never um, have heard before. Figure B.2 is a median section, median, ending with an N, section taken of a, taken of a cadaver. And here you can see in very much detail exactly what, it, what you would find on the inside of a human body. It's much more interesting to learn this kind of anatomy uh, if you're doing a surgery rotation because there, instead of the tissue being dead and different colors of gray and white and black, you see it uh, pink uh, and healthy. Figure B.3 shows superficial anatomy of the trunk of a body, both the skin, the outer part, and slightly uh, internal to the skin. This would be if you had peeled off the skin, these are the parts of anatomy you would see. Uh, B.4 shows anatomy at the level of the rib cage and what's called the greater omentum. This is a layer of tissue that is very protective of the abdominal cavity. It lays across the abdomen, and if uh, we were doing surgery on a person, this has to be reflected up and out of the abdomen uh, so we can see the anatomy there in section B.5. The lungs, the intestines, you can see the liver, uh, the heart, the spleen. And you can see um, these two pictures show these are anatomy of a man. 8.6, 8.7 are somewhat comparable and these are showing anatomy of the female. B.8 and B.9 show uh, first the anterior view of the thorax and abdomen of both the man on top and the female on the bottom part. And then the posterior anatomy, again, the male on top and the female on the bottom. You are not going to be responsible for knowing every single name. Do not get in a panic and think that you are going to have to memorize everything on this. I did when I was in medical school but I did not even need to take an anatomy course in order to be accepted into medical school. You'll be heads and, and tails above everybody else if you go to a, a professional medical program of some sort. Okay, section B11 and B12 and B13 show again the uh, anterior, uh, the thorax cavity, a sagittal section of the uh, abdominal cavity, um, the, I'm sorry, the chest cavity, thorax, and then the abdominal cavity. These are all, again, uh, anatomy that you would see in a cadaver. 8B14 shows median sections of the pelvic uh, cavity, male and female. Okay, we will leave the rest of B. Uh, there's just a lot more details showing uh, different parts of the arm, the hands, uh, the legs. My legs certainly don't look that anymore and I have scars all over them. I've had to have three different joint replacements. God did not give me very good cartilage. Okay, those are the two atlases, A and B. Now, as I said, we will go back to chapter 8. It starts on page 229. The reading for week 2 is on only includes sections 1 or 8.1 and 8.2.
8.1 is overview of the skeleton, and 8.2 is the skull. We do not, in this, actually talk about the internal uh, anatomy of bones. We learn that in a different chapter that we will find later. Okay. Going into chapter or section 8.1 on page 230, first you see a general overview along with figure 8.1 that shows the adult skeleton. Uh, the adult skeleton contains about 206 bones. This is not uniformly exact in everybody. There may be a few different here and there. At birth, we have 270 bones, and we will look later at how and why that happens. Uh, table 8.1 shows the, the primary bones, the names of the primary bones of the adult skeletal system. And there you will see them uh, the skull, cranial bones, facial bones, etc., uh, etc. Et Again, you do not have to memorize all of these, but it's a very good idea to know at least primary ones. In uh, the next section, in Table 8.2, we will look more at, at anatomical features or markings that are on the bone. Uh, if you look across on page 233, uh, figure 8.2, you will see representative bones, the scapula in the back, uh, a lateral view of the skull, a femur, which is the big biggest bone in the leg, the humerus, which is the upper bone in the arm. And there you'll see some of the uh, names for some of the different uh, parts on the bone. The skull is very, very difficult, uh, but you should know some of the very basic parts. Now, we mentioned that the, uh, an infant has so many more bones than an adult does. And that is because an infant's skull uh, still has individual bones that have not fused together. If you look at the pictures, eight, or figures 8.2, 8.3, you will see very fine little lines uh, that show where these many different bones have finally joined together. Uh, they, these, a lot of these bones are floating in an infant and eventually they do fuse. Okay, then there are many, many, many more pictures. This is probably more from uh, an anatomy for nurses or anatomy for medical school or dentists. Again, no part of these, at least. Cranial bones, here's table 8.3. Uh, show bones and the, their foramina. A foramen just means an opening. This is an opening that something will pass through from one part of the body to another. Uh, figure 8.6 over on 236 shows these suture lines, much better detail. And this is an adult view of the top of the skull and shows where the different bones used to be when they were separate. The bones of the skull are extremely difficult again. Try to at least memorize some of the major ones. If, you, if I say where is the frontal bone, you should be able to show where it is, or the parietal bones. The frontal bone can, covers the frontal cortex of the brain. The parietal bones cover the parietal cortex, 
temporal bones cover the temporal lobes. That's where they get their names. The occipital bone is in the very back of the skull, um, and it covers the occiput. M the primary thing in the primary part of the brain in the occiput um, is the uh, occipital lobe of the brain. Um, okay, that's enough. Other bones, other bones. This is a good textbook if you're going to medical school. In on page 245, you will see a section that you ought to read. Uh, it's called The Skull in Infancy and Childbirth. Those of you who have had ba children, uh, babies, and then they've grown up, hopefully, to be healthy, uh, older children and adults, you remember the so-called soft spot in the top of the skull. Um, and then you will be able to feel very commonly in a, if, in a baby or an infant or child uh, where these bones will become sutures later and join onto each other. Okay, section 8.1 and 8.2 end on page 246. Looks like a lot to learn, doesn't it? Okay, chapter 10 begins on page 308. We will be looking again at only 10.1, which is called the structural and functional organization of muscles. And 10.2 are the muscles of the head and neck. You will learn that there are basically uh, three types of muscles. The skeletal muscle is all called, it's voluntary muscle. Our brain can control the um, contraction and relaxation of the skeletal bones or the skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is under the control of the brain stem, and we have no control over that. That makes up tissues such as the linings of the organs in the abdomen, uh, the heart, etc. And third, um, well, the, crane, the heart is made up of uh, cranial muscle. We will study that in much more detail later. Okay. All of these bones together form the muscular system. And your author says that there are about 600 different muscles in the human body. Um, quite, quite a task if you were asked to memorize all of those. I learned the most of them back when a long time ago when I went to medical school, by the way. I had different colored hair and no artificial joints back then. But anyway, here you'll see some the five different functions, primary functions of muscles. These you should know and know in detail. Movement, primarily the skeletal muscles. These muscles enable us to move our body from place to place and to move individual body parts. Um, there's skeletal muscle, but there's also smooth muscle when we talk about circul the circulatory system, feeding, digestion, etc. A second function is stability. Muscles help maintain our posture by preventing movement that we don't want. Third function is the control of body openings and passages. There are several muscles called sphincters. For example, at the bottom of the esophagus is the esophageal sphincter. When the food passes through our uh, mouth and down the esophagus into the stomach, that uh, esophageal sphincter will first relax to allow the food into the stomach, 
and then it will tighten in order to keep the food in the stomach uh, and not go in reverse back up into the esophagus. That is called reflux uh, and ca can cause some severe problems. There's also a sphincter at the outlet of the stomach controlled by the uh, autonomic nervous system. Another function of the muscle that you might not realize is in heat production. Your author says that approximately 85% uh, of our own body heat is produced by skeletal muscles when they are at work. Finally, the fifth uh, function of, of muscles is in glycemic control. A lot of authors do not include this as a primary function, but it's sort of interesting to read through. Uh, the skeletal muscles primarily can help control the regulation of blood glucose. Now, um, figure 10.1 is a set of individual uh, sketches A, B, and C that I would like you to look at and look at in detail. This shows an, a uh, part of the quadriceps muscle, because that is the uh, hip joint shown at the top. You'll see that that entire muscle joins on uh, to the bone by way of a connective tissue called a tendon. Then there is a la another layer of connective tissue called the fascia that uh, adheres to the muscle and covers it. It allows different muscles to be able to, when they move, to be able to slide over each other and not bind up together. There's a section right below 10.1 that shows the different connective tissues um, and what are called fascicles. Don't pay too much attention to the word fascicle, but I would like you to know what endomyceum, uh, perimyceum, epimyceum, and fascia mean. Okay, figure 10.3 shows different, describes different muscle compartments. These different compartments include muscles that work together uh, but are separated from each or the, the different muscles are separated each other uh, by their fascia. This compartment also includes the nerves and the blood supply that supply uh, these muscles. Here you can see the compartment uh, of in, the, in the lower leg area um, showing the uh, what commonly called the calf muscle um, and the different nerves, arteries, veins, bones that go through that. These compartments can come, become very uh, important if you suffer a severe injury uh, to a muscles in one of these compartments then what can develop is a phenomenon called a carp compartmental um, syndrome. The if you have injured a muscle to the point that it begins to bleed, you, you will find that there is no place for that blood to uh, go. It stays in that muscle compartment, building up more and more pressure which can put uh, a lot of uh, pressure on the nerves and the arteries uh, and cause a lot, of, in, a lot of health problems. Figure 10.4 uh, shows the muscles in the upper arm. The large bone there is the humerus. And this is a good uh, sketch or a good figure to show <clears throat> what are called synergistic and antagonistic muscle pairs. Every skeletal muscle uh, has 
it has a pair. For example, the biceps muscle to the right in that figure allows the forearm uh, to flex at the elbow. The extensors are the two, bone, two muscles of the triceps. These are the synergistic and antagonistic muscle pairs. Every muscle also, in order to function, uh, must have both an origin and an insertion. The origin of the muscle uh, is usually more proximal where it joins onto a bone that is not moving. Here you can see that both the biceps and the triceps attach both to the scapula and the humerus, and those don't move. But the insertions of these muscles uh, are to the, two, the uh, radius and ulna in the lower part of the arm. So when these muscles contract, uh, the joint flexes or contracts and the forearm moves. Okay. Um, also, just want you to know, of course, that every no, no muscle, no skeletal muscle, can function without innervation. The, the word innervation, I N N, innervation means the nerves that supply that muscle. Cranial nerves, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves that you will learn later uh, as part of the central nervous system. We also have numerous different spinal nerves in pairs that come off of the uh, spinal column. These control all of the muscles um, in the abdomen, the arms, and the legs. Okay, starting on three, page 316, 317, this shows very detailed sketches of the muscular system, an anterior view and a posterior view, and you can tell that the right and left sides are different. Uh, one it shows the more superficial muscles. The other shot side shows the deeper muscles. On picture or on page 319 is a young lady showing different, showing off her muscles of facial expression. Um, most primates which we are one of, um, have almost all the same muscles of facial expression. If you have ever studied any of the apes, uh, you will see that they have a an inf great ability to also make many different uh, grimaces and smiles and so on, many different expressions. Now, Table 10.1 shows the different muscles if you had, as if you had removed the skin. And these are the muscles that allow the uh, face, different parts of the, all the facial bones uh, to move. 10.2 shows muscles for chewing and swallowing. 10.9, figure 10.9 shows muscles of the tongue and pharynx. 10, table 10.2 again shows more muscles in the neck and muscles controlling the head. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that this does help you to get some of my feeling. I don't write the tests. I don't get to pick the questions. And sometimes you will have a question that I didn't cover in here, but was in the book. I apologize for that. Um, if I were in charge, I would probably write my own quizzes and tests. 
only giving you questions that were showing the things that are of the most importance. But, as I said, that comes from people with higher rank and a higher pay grade than I have. Um, and that's what we have to live with. Thank you very much. And you will see this very soon in Facebook. And just so I didn't forget how to label it, I wrote it down. And I think one of the cats is laying on it. Okay, there it is. Biology 250. This one will say Atlas A slash B, um, semicolon, chapters 8 and 10. Lecture, Dr. Ken Sproul. Uh, again, thank you for your attention, and I hope that this helps you. See you again.